Hello and welcome to another episode of the CG Garage. This is episode number 360. It's a big one, Kristen. It's a big one. It is Christian Lang, Peter Mitev, and Vlado Koylazov. A lot of you obviously know who Vlado is, and uh, most of you know who Peter is. He's the CEO of Chaos Group, and Christian Lang is the CEO of Enscape. And we are talking about, uh, you know, the 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 idea of Chaos and Enscape. We're in the process of merging these two companies, and that is a big deal. And I'm sure there's a lot of questions going on. And people want to know from all sides of the things what is the what does you know does it mean to have uh, chaos and enscape uh, merging? So, uh, what did you think of the podcast with Christian and Peter and Vlado? Uh, it was great. Obviously, it's mm -hmm. um, we get to hear chaos and enscape and how they are merging. Um, and Christian also gives us a little bit of his roots, uh, roots mm -hmm. and uh, enscape's origin. So that's very interesting to hear about. Um, and then Peter get, just goes into a great explanation of how chaos and enscape fit together so well, um, and how it's kind of been in the making for a while. Um, mm -hmm. And then Vlado uh, just discusses like no, new workflows. Um, you guys get into real time and the metaverse. So yeah. you guys, it's just a great podcast all around. Yeah, yeah, it really, it really is. I mean, what I really like about, uh, you know, all three of these guys, and obviously I've known Peter and Vlado for, for, for years, and Christian seems to be, uh, you know, really the same, the same kind of person is down to earth per people, very pragmatic answers to things uh, and not sort of talking above certain things. And when we get into the discussion, for example, as an example, we talk a lot about what the metaverse is and how a merger like this would serve what, you know, our, our interpretation of what the metaverse is. And I think all of them give us great answers and are really cool about it, you know, and Vlado uh, does as well as, as well as Christian and, and Peter. So they all give their own thoughts on it. And I thought that was really cool. We also talk a lot about ray tracing and rendering in general. Uh, and Vlado and I get into that discussion about the role of ray tracing in real time, obviously, because uh, of what uh, what Enscape does and its role in real time and how we can work, leverage some of those things. So it was a really cool discussion. I'm very excited about it. I am very excited about what this implies uh, for uh, for Chaos and for Enscape on, in all factors. You know, not just obviously Enscape is obviously very focused on architecture, but I think right now because of the, the markets that uh, Chaos has, uh, including a big portion in a lot of visual effects and automotive and design and a bunch of those other things how this merger is going to uh, enable a lot of those industries all of those industries to to take advantage of some of those things so really exciting lots to dive into i have a feeling this isn't going to be the the, the, the only podcast we do on this subject and I'm excited to have more people from Manscaped on uh, to talk about uh, their you know what they their, what their thoughts are on this as well as all of, obviously people from from chaos and their thoughts on it so this is going to be a lot of stuff going on and, and very excited to see where this all goes forward uh, we don't have any announcements because obviously this podcast itself was one of the big announcements that we've been working on and I'm sure a lot of you guys have questions uh, but if you guys want to hear more about this or have questions for follow-up questions from this podcast, let us know. And uh, we'd love to hear from you. So Kristen, where can they reach us uh, if they'd like to know more about the podcast or ask us questions on the, on the, on this specific episode? Yeah. So you can go to facebook.com slash CG garage podcast or chaos.com slash CG garage. And you can even leave us some comments on our YouTube channel and go to youtube.com slash chaos group TV. And of course, you can always just email us directly. We'll always answer those emails or try to answer them uh, or address them right here on the podcast itself. So just go to labs at chaosgroup.com and let us know, you know what you think there as well. But with that, please enjoy episode number 360 with Christian Lang, Peter Mitev, and of course, our good friend Vlado Koylazov. Welcome to another CG Garage. Where the chaos group talks You'll know it's over when the last bucket drops We're gonna fire off rays In high dynamic range We know that ambient occlusion is passe Global illumination won't lead you astray And while image-based lighting is really swell 
You need to make sure everything has for now. Well, cool. Thank you guys so much for being on uh, uh, and to be able to talk about this. I know that I have a lot of users that are very interested in finding out uh, you know, what exactly is this uh, amazing uh, little merger or not so little merger that's happening between Enscape and Chaos and finding out, you know, what we can do potentially together. So that would be really great. So first of all, I think, you know, a lot of people know who Vlado is. A lot of people know who Peter is, but not many uh, people on my podcast know who Christian is. And uh, I'd like to know a little bit about uh, your background and, you know, where you come from and then basically how this whole uh, thing with Enscape started. And let's just figure out how this all connects. Okay, great. Thank you, Chris. And uh, interesting question. Uh, um, Maybe I have even a little bit the same background than Peter because because uh, I think Peter studied sometimes in the past um, and then he realized uh, that's not really what he wants to do and then he started something in the space of computer graphics. So for me it was quite similar. I studied architecture and then I realized I do not really want to become an architect. So I I um, my passion was always for architectural visualization. So I I started my own company already 1987 in the space of ArcVis um, using 3DS at that time and uh, AutoCAD and a couple of other tools and visualizing architectural design. When the unification in Germany happened, uh, there were a lot of uh, building projects in East Germany where investors from West Germany wanted to make some changes to the buildings and all those buildings were under historical protection. So they came to people like me and I visualized how it would look like. And then we traveled together to East Germany and presented kind of the new look and feel of the buildings to the majors and to the communities. And, uh, and that's how it all started. Um, and then I decided in uh, 1996 to enter the corporate world. I worked for Graphisoft for four years, I'm a, I'm a CAD software provider in the architectural space. 2000, I moved to Autodesk. I spent almost 14 years at Autodesk um, and then I decided, yeah, and I was in the space of AC, of manufacturing, media and entertainment. I worked with the guys in Montreal uh, together um, and then I decided 2013 that I wanted to experience something completely different and uh, outside of that space. So I joined or entered the big data world for three years. I, uh, I, and then I decided once again, I wanted to experience another kind of completely new thing. I joined the, the, the world of uh, data center technology, servers and backup and recovery technology. Um, and yeah, came back uh, in 2020 um, to Enscape. That's a little bit my background. So I would say passion, very passionate uh, in the space of architectural visualization and visualization in general and design. Um, um, but also with a business management uh, background. Yeah, that's interesting that you you, you did those. I, honestly, you have a very similar back. I have. I'm also come from an architecture background and and uh, did architecture visualization for <laughs> many years. Then I decided to leave that and go into media yeah. and entertainment itself. So uh, I I really understand that 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 passion and understanding what what that means. But it's interesting. Uh, you know, you were at Autodesk, and so obviously you were in the the realm of the software world, etc. Uh, and you you joined uh, Enscape in 2020. You said. Correct. Yes. Uh, and okay. Was, uh, yeah, right at the edge of uh, from a startup into a kind of a scale up phase. Um, when I joined 60 people at that time, today 110 people. So um, fast growing um, business. Yeah. Right. Right. That's interesting. Uh, well, tell us a little bit about Enscape and, you know, its, its origins and, and then, you know, how, how you came to be part of it as well. Yeah. Um, good question. Um, so founded 2015 in Germany here in Karlsruhe, which is in the southwest of Germany. The reason why we are in the southwest of Germany, Karlsruhe, is because of the two founders of Enscape, Thomas Wilberger and Moritz Luck, both studied here at the KIT, the Karlsruhe Institute of Technology. And they studied, uh, Thomas studied computer graphics here. So, um, um, and uh, with a couple of uh, other people, they kind of, uh, um, thought about um, uh, coming up with something what is maybe different to what already existed at that time um, and not that much thinking about visualization but much more thinking about workflow and how can we use visualization 
to optimize the workflow and how can we bring, how can we use visualization as a kind of a language to enable the architects and the designers to um, develop the final design, to come to the final design, to communicate the final design, to um, align everyone who is involved in the building project on the final design, uh, much more that direction rather than visualizing the final design. So that's how it all started. Um, uh, they, uh, uh, I think, very smart decision, were very focused at the beginning. They just focused on Autodesk Revit and uh, developed a, an integration into Revit. So Enscape is not a standalone software. Enscape doesn't write its own format, um, file format. Enscape is a, an integrated uh, software tool into CAD software, which is again, um, kind of the, the visual translation of, let's say, very numeric and uh, line-driven design, uh, computer-aided design. Um, that's how it all started. And it's, uh, it really helps the, the architects and the designers to understand the constructability of their, of their concepts and, and to validate the ideas and to communi communicate their, their intent. Right, but it, it's also more uh, importantly, it's actually a, a real-time renderer as well, right? So that's one it of the big, big aspects of it. That that, allows that it to be... Yeah, you're right. That was another kind of key criteria at the beginning when they, the founders uh, clearly said, we do not want to come up with another kind of offline renderer. We want to come up with something what is different. And uh, it was from the first uh, day, it was a, um, a GPU-based uh, um, uh, real-time rendering uh, engine and uh, what what started at the beginning just as the rendering engine then over time obviously became a kind of a we call it a workflow optimization tool because to be honest the whole rendering and the visualization is not the the key criteria criteria for the Enscape users it's really the way how it helps the users coming to the final design. It's highly accessible because it's everyone can use it. You do not need to be the, the specialist. Any architect and designer can use it immediately um, because it right. is fully integrated in the CAD. And so, I, yeah, you definitely are focused on the usability of it uh, and uh, making it, you know, fairly simple for for most people to, or, or intuitive for most people to use. Uh, but just just to get, because I know some people are going to ask some technical questions, so I'm going to get: is is Enscape its own renderer, or is it based on another? Is it using Unity or Unreal as as its as a renderer? Is its own renderer, right? It's its own renderer. Yes, developed in house okay. by our own guys. Yes. Okay, so that's and that's really interesting as well because the fact that you guys have uh, your own uh, rasterized render and real time solutions that are going on, but uh, it's interesting also. I mean, that, that, like you said, there's a it does a lot uh, beyond rendering, right? It also does a lot of um, it's a, it's a, it's almost a platform more than it is anything in some cases uh, because it can. It has a huge library of assets that you can use. It has a lot of features that you can use. So, I mean, like, what are some of the things that it that it can do uh, that are that really can help? I mean, I can imagine someone in Revit is like, what does it really look like? <laughs> you know? Yeah, and that's the solution, right? Yeah, that's yeah, a, a good good question. And you're right. There is a in the meantime quite large asset library. What is it? Almost three thousand assets, and all of these assets are real time ready. So the, these are low polygon assets with a high visual um, quality output. Um, but what, what, what is it? Um, again, it's the visual translation of, of, the, of the design. And, uh, and because it's so uh, deeply integrated into the CAD, it, it, it's, it's, a, it's a seamless process, right? While you are designing, you immediately are getting that visual representation of your design. And you can communicate it to your teammates, uh, to clients, to contractors. It's uh, used for the design iterations, um, and it's it's a uh, um, it's it's a kind of a seamless workflow because you do not need to export a file. Then you maybe visualize it. Then you have the conversation. Then you need to make changes. You import it back. It's a bi-directional connection into the CAD. 
Um, and, and, and the cat uh, is the, uh, the one and only version of truth, right? We, again, Enscape right. doesn't, we do not write our own kind of uh, file format. Any kind of change you're doing because of the visual representation of the design is immediately in the cat as well. Um, and, that's, and that's why it's um, so much, let's say, workflow focused, uh, much more workflow focused rather than just pure visualization quality. Yeah, yeah, oh, that's very interesting. And I'm sure we'll get a little bit more into detail, but that's certainly going to give people an idea of what Enscape uh, right. offers people and what it does. Now, Peter, let's let's talk about your your, your journey, your secret little uh, journey quest that you've been doing for the last couple of years that led you to to meet with Christian and to talk out to the Enscape guys. How did how did this this happen? How did this all this all come come to be? Well, uh, Chris, as you know, we've been talking about something that we call the pyramid but it actually started a very long time ago probably actually if, if i have to be honest the first iterations of this conversation probably occurred back in 2011 ish uh and it was when we acquired an american company uh, as you know is javis they were developing we licensed them to develop v-ray for uh, rhino and sketchup and we acquired them in order to be able to move faster forward and uh that's, that's pretty much when we started thinking about actually closing a much bigger uh, need and gap in the, in the, on the market where we could see the potential of driving the architects using both SketchUp and Rhino uh, and later Revit as well in a, into a completely different area. And that's when we started thinking about uh, what can we do beyond rendering? Because as you know, we've been focusing our high-end quality photorealistic rendering forever. Uh, this was always our focus, uh, whether it's in the architectural industry, whether it's in the advertisement, whether it's in the visual effects industries. It was always our focus to deliver the highest quality uh, output, uh, regardless of the amount of time it takes. So as you, as you know, 10 hours, 15 hours of render times were not unusual per frame. So uh, that was something that really we really were focusing for a very long time. But actually, we could see the gap where people would actually use tools like Rhino and SketchUp and the others for design, designing uh, concepts and coming up with design specific uh, things where they required much faster uh, output and they were less concerned about the quality so they could really focus on the design and they could after that, uh, they wanted after that to take that design somewhere else, for example, 3ds Max, where they could use high end tools like V-Ray to actually render really high quality stuff. And one of the challenges we were facing from day one was actually how could they transfer the data between the different applications because as you know most of the file formats they only support the geometry sometimes hierarchy sometimes a bunch of other things but none of the file formats actually support the rendering information information required uh, to render uh, the same output in the same uh, in the different applications so that was something that was always renderer specific and because it was renderer specific, unless you had the same renderer on both sides, you could all, you actually always lost information. And in, in within the last 20 years, they were all, always coming up with different file formats and APIs to deliver the shaders and all of that. But at the end of the day, none of the renderers actually supported 100, were supported 100%. And there was always some crucial information that was always uh, kind of left behind when people were using the standard file formats. That's how we came up with the V-Ray scene file format where we could actually transfer the shaders information and we could transfer 100% of the information from one application to the other. That's when the whole uh, actually uh, idea originated that we could actually bridge the gap between the different applications in ways that nobody else could. And that's when we started talking about actually uh, coming out, you know, uh, uh, looking at a much bigger group of people rather than focusing on the visualization spe specialists, we were actually thinking about delivering uh, workflows for people to transfer information between different apps whenever they need it for the purpose of, of visualizing. And this whole concept was, uh, we started tackling a lot of the technical problems and issues uh, in many different areas. We were coming up with the real-time rendering tools. We were coming up with real-time uh, both ray tracers and uh, rasterizers as well. And we were coming up with shading information transfer. And a lot of those things started occurring in the last few years, which was we were, we were tapping in all the different areas, technological areas, where we would require the right tools to be able to bridge the gap. And then we realized that we actually wanted to do this in a much 
much faster, to be honest, on a different uh, pace. And while we started doing the fundraising process where we thought that uh, by expanding more aggressively, we could actually bridge the, this gap much faster, somewhere in these, in, in these conversations we met with Chris Lang. And we figured instead of actually penetrating the market of Enscape and starting to aggressively compete there with Enscape and start to destroy value on both sides, because that would uh, sooner or later happen, we actually figured out that we are very much complementary. Uh, at, at the day when we started co the, these conversations, we hardly uh, we hardly compete because, as Chris very well said, they were focusing on delivering the workflows and helping the designers actually iterate through the designs in real time. And we could actually deliver the uh, the technology to bridge the gap between the real time and the offline rendering in terms of shading information and quality. And that's how we that's how we sat down and started uh, discussing these ideas. And we ended up merging because we thought that we're so much complementary, we can help each other so much that instead of wasting years and years of time to develop the kind of uh, the competing tools on both sides, we could just merge and uh, within just hopefully. Uh, uh, a year or so, we could actually start delivering much faster the uh, the results where we could bridge the gap between real-time design uh, iterations and off high-quality offline rendering with all the real-time ray tracing included and everything else required by the artists to to visualize and design at the same time. Yeah, that's that 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 makes a lot of sense. <laughs> it makes a lot of sense. Now, Vlado, obviously, you know, you've you you and I have uh, conversations nearly every day about ray tracing and about some high end complex CG stuff. And well, I think this is a very interesting thing. What are your what are your thoughts about how uh, you know uh, us you know chaos and and, and Enscape uh, coming together are going to affect things and and about rendering and real time rendering and rasterized rendering and ray tracing how they can all kind of work together. So um, it all starts with uh, workflows, right? So um, the way our products are actually complementary. So you start your design and um, using Enscape to see what's going on. Um, and then at the end of this whole design process, you probably need high-end uh, visuals to use for marketing purposes or presentation purposes. And that's where um, tools like uh, Corona and V-Ray come in. So, um, to me, um, there are a few things here. Um, yeah, being able to exchange information between our uh, products will be the first thing we want to do, like taking whatever you've done in SK and moving it over to V-Ray to finish it up, uh, or maybe going the other way around. Uh, these are some of the first things we want to handle. Um, obviously, at Chaos, we've been uh, dabbling with real-time uh, technologies as well. Uh, we have Chaos Vantage. We also started uh, working on VR Vision. And uh, there's a, a lot of, um, obviously, Enscape is a little bit uh, further um, in that respect. So there's a lot to learn from uh, what uh, we have an escape versus what we have in our other products. And hopefully we will be able to come up with a solution that's uh, more useful for everybody. And it's not just the rendering part, right? We also have the um, asset libraries. We have Cosmos on the Chaos side and there's the Enscape library. Uh, and we probably uh, would want to make those work together. Right. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about our real time because real time is obviously a big, a big deal in this, in this, uh, you know, with this, this merger and as well as, you know, some of the things that both companies have been focusing on. Um, and I think that there's obviously, I've been, I, you know, I've been working with a lot of things in terms of Vantage and seeing where Vantage is going, uh, as well as sort of understanding the general idea of what a, what a, a real time uh, workflow and, and uh, can actually be uh, entail. So where where does our real time where do things connect like with in terms of like how, with vantage and enscape and envision like how how do these things kind of come together or how do they complement each other or how can they work together or or learn from each other or how does how's that going to work <laughs> so um the way that i see it um enscape is really designed to be a, a workflow tool um, and the goal there is to give the best idea of a design uh, without too many distractions. Um, and it works on all kinds of hardware. Um, Vantage, on the other hand, we kind of specifically wanted to focus on uh, path tracing to make it um, as close as possible to an actual production render, but 
still keeping it real time. So Vantage can handle complex uh, visualization scenarios, like if you want to do car headlights or um, if you wanted lots of glass things, uh, Vantage can do that. Um, Escape is uh, kind of still uh, based on rasterization, so um, getting things like refractions and refractions is slightly uh, more complicated because that's not the goal of the engine. Um, but um, there are technologies that like both engines can learn from each other. Um, and at the moment, they have kind of a different trajectory. We want to keep uh, Vantage more um, higher end and potentially slightly more accurate, but still real time. Now, whereas um, Enscape is designed to be uh, as fast as possible and to run everywhere and to give people uh, really be a help, help to their workflow. Yeah. Okay. And Peter, you you mentioned you mentioned your pyramid that you're that you like to talk about and how that works. So now that you know you know I, I know that you know we've been focusing a lot of different our products, right? Chaos is uh, uh, especially V-Ray has has tried to bridge many different types of products and many different types of customers. Uh, and this sort of uh, you know cha- changes a little bit our landscape or makes or in some ways. How do you feel that uh, Enscape? Uh, Enscape will affect some of the, 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 you know, having them be part of our team will affect some of the development that we do at Chaos in terms of what we can, what we're looking at and what we're focusing on in terms of the different areas that we're, we're doing at this point. Okay, so I'll, I'll start with the pyramid. So basically the concept of the pyramid originated somewhere between, uh, you know, our, us con, you know, having conversations about the technology and what is needed in the market. And somehow we came up with the concept that uh, we we have a pyramid, uh, and uh, it's the simplest way to look at the technology in the CG space, where on the top you would see the smallest amount of people in terms of market size, but you would see the highest quality demand, where in terms of technology, the amount of research and all of that is, is, is the maximum requirements are actually in there. And they're actually, usually that's what we call the visualization sp- specialists and they can be in the visual effects studios they can be the in the advertising industry they could be in the architectural industry as well that's where pretty much people want to see the highest quality content but at the same time it's on the top of the pyramid which is kind of the smallest chunk of the market when we start to look at uh, lower parts of the pyramid we could actually see the designers where you see a much bigger group of people that doesn't require that much of sophisticated technology but they have very specific requirements about it uh, and they're a much larger group where you actually, the whole approach to this group of people and their requirements is very different. You can't just get the technology from top, for example, uh, VRA, let's say in Maya, and give it in the hands of an average architectural designer because uh, it's it's an overkill. They, they don't require that much of technology. They don't require that much of knowledge. They don't want to learn that much of knowledge to drive it forward. They need something simple and be able to actually execute faster uh, their designs. And kind of the bridging part between the top of the pyramid and the lower part of the pyramid is what we call the workflows in terms of data flows. That's that's where we actually get the knowledge that we have developed for the visual effects and advertisement in- industries and put it in the hands of designers, uh, where we bridge the gap between uh, these different tools, but we kind of give it uh, in a way that people can use it in real time and within their environment as they're, that they're used to, for example, Revit, or whatever other the tool that they want. And this is this is the way we look at the pyramid. And actually, if you go even lower in the pyramid, you actually see even broader market, where you actually see the consumers. And that's what we call uh, our own understanding of the metaverse. That's where the consumers are. They want to consume all of the digital content coming from the specialists and the designers on top. And you can see a much broader group of people who actually use uh, different tools in different media, maybe some sort of uh, consumer goggles or something like that, to actually experience the VR or just on a screen of a mobile phone, uh, all of the content that was generated by the specialists on the, in, in the top part of the pyramid. And that's that's pretty much the way we look at the, at the computer graphics industry and the ability to drive the data back and forth between the top, bottom and, and back, that's what we call the workflows. And that's, that's how we can actually drive the data. And that's the way we usually, that's one way of looking at the whole market and the technology stacks. 
Yeah. yeah. Now, Christian, I have some a question to you. I mean, obviously, you know, we talked about the, you know, this this pyramid and how 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 uh, chaos is going to try to you know integrate all their products on the top and bottom in some ways. Obviously, Enscape has focused a, a great deal or, or, uh, on a specific type of market, a specific type of customer, and serves their need very well. How do you feel now that you're, uh, you know, as part of a company that has a much broader scope of, of, of customer base, yeah. uh, how do you feel that Enscape can fit in different areas and can sort of uh, 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 complement some of those different areas, like including visual effects and, and things of that nature? That's a, that's a good question. And to be honest, I think that's the opportunity we have. Uh, but that's also what we will figure out over the next couple of what weeks, month, uh, quarters, um, um, I think, again, um, the, the idea behind everything, I think what we have to do in, in, in our space is we, need, we should find ways to kind of democratize technology, to, to connect specialists with non-specialists, with design professionals, with prosumers, with consumers, because um, there is no natural um, connection between those, right? And if technology is just built for that specific part of the pyramid, what Peter is talking about, then typically it's impossible to connect them with the design professionals, the, the specialists, the visualization specialists, with the design professionals, with the prosumers, with the consumers. So I think that's the opportunity for us. And that's an opportunity which is going across the technology stack. So, which is then our job, obviously, it's an opportunity which is going beyond different industries. So, yes, you're right. Right now, Enscape is mainly focusing on the A in AEC, um, <laughs> not even on the E and C, really. It's just on the A, right? Um, but uh, interior designers, landscape designers, stage designers. But then, hey, let's go beyond that. It's product design, it's manufacturing, it's automotive, it's aerospace and defense. It's then, of course, yeah, VFX, it's film, uh, entertainment. Um, so I think we will figure out how we, how our customers at the end of the day will benefit from that and how we can leverage the technologies. But uh, it's obvious and, uh, and, and that's what we call when we came together and when the conversation started, um, someone said, this is a slam dunk, <laughs> chaos and Enscape, because to be honest, yes, it's, it's just complementary. And sure. if, if we don't find a way to do that, I think no one will find a way doing that. So that's the opportunity, right? Absolutely, absolutely. I think it's very interesting. I mean, and I think you know, as as you guys know, I, I spend a lot of time in the in the in the in the VFX market and the M and E market, and sort of thinking about that. And what's I think fascinating is a conversation that's starting to happen a lot more often these days, especially is in the world of virtual production, right? In virtual production, what's starting to happen now, very similar to how we you know talked about the the architect doing the design iterations and then passing that on to an archivist person to do the pretty picture, uh, those lines are blurring in some ways because a lot of people are working in real-time virtual sets and comp and complementing each other with virtual production. So having that workflow work from the design process of real-time and then the, the rendering uh, offline is kind of blending. Do you feel that there's an opportunity there for some of the things that Chaos is working on to sort of look at that whole process of you know, from the M and E, taking that workflow and passing it on to the, uh, I mean, from AEC and passing that workflow to the M and E world, so that they, everyone can basically benefit from that from that transition of design and visualization at the same time. Who wants to answer that? <laughs> I think that's maybe Peter of Lado. <laughs> yeah, sure. so thanks, Chris. Uh, so, so uh, yeah. Uh, there's there's been a lot of efforts in the virtual studio production studio space and uh, this was also something very interesting for us years ago and one of the reasons we actually uh, started working a little bit more on the high quality real-time stuff was exactly thinking about having in mind that the virtual studio would be something that we'll probably want to tackle at one point in the future but uh, thankfully now with with Enscape's uh, support and technology we could actually do that much quicker and designing uh, virtual sets, putting them in the hands of a lot of people, uh, and then being able to produce high, the high quality output at the end of that workflow, that would be something that I think 
uh, would be a no-brainer for us to, to address at one point. Uh, and the question is, how do we prioritize our efforts, our resources and all of that? But it's definitely a great opportunity for both Enscape and us to enter a completely new uh, space. And uh, we definitely see that as an opportunity. So uh, as you know, Chris, we've, we've done uh, an experimental project uh, with uh, Kevin Margot a lot of time ago, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, and we were trying to experiment with real-time motion capture data and feed it into uh, VRART. And uh, we were exper experimenting that, well, I don't know, seven years ago, six years ago. Yep. <laughs> Very familiar with that project. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, as you know, there were a lot of challenges back then. But but now with, with Enscape and all the real-time uh, technology progressing so much uh, further than what it used to be, it becomes a much more realistic uh, you know, project that we could hopefully tackle in the future. Yeah, absolutely. So, Vlado, you and I have had a conversation for years about rendering and ray tracing uh, over 20 years now. Uh, but <laughs> uh, I'm fascinated, you know, there's something that when, 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 when uh, real-time technology started to come in a lot more play into the, into the uh, M&E world in terms of what it's able to do, we became very interested in that. And one of the, the quotes that you and I, or one of the things that you and I came to conclusion is that we realized that at some point, real-time rendering will become the norm. However, we also feel that ray tracing will eventually take replace uh, rasterized rendering uh, at some time. So, what is your feeling about the future of rendering? Uh, you know, in, both in terms of the real time aspect of it, as well as the difference between rasterized and ray tracing, and how those are all going to kind of come together at some point. Do you still feel that those are things that can work different ways? So, um, I still think real time ray tracing is is the future. Um, everything that I've seen uh, points in that direction. So there is uh, there is no change there. Um, obviously, we are all waiting for the hardware to um, first be more widely available and then to become faster. I think <laughs> right now we are what at the like second generation of ray tracing hardware. So maybe we need to get to uh, two more generations to make it really feasible. Um, but um, yeah, ray tracing is, and Enscape does ray tracing, right? So it's not just, um, it's not just for high-end stuff. Uh, you need ray tracing even uh, in the case of Enscape, even when you are designing the building or, or your project, you still need to have ray tracing. Just because so many things in, uh, in the physical world uh, are either glass or mirrors, uh, things like that, which you can't really do otherwise. Um, and things are going real time. Obviously, we get real time um, engines uh, coming to all sorts of situations that were previously maybe an exclusive domain of online rendering. And this will continue um, as the real time engines get more versatile and uh, more powerful and with better quality and all that. Um, and at the same time, offline rendering still has its place, at least for a few more years. Um, for many reasons, some effects are just really expensive to compute accurately in real time. Yes, you can get all sorts of approximations and all that, and, and that's great. But uh, if you do need that final quality, then uh, you need to spend the time on it. And there's no way around this, um, at least not right now, until, not until the hardware is more powerful. And um, we still continue to research ways to make offline rendering faster and more efficient. Um, there is that. And um, the hardware that does um, offline rendering also gets faster, both CPUs and GPUs. Um, so that's still going on. Yeah, I think, I mean, I've, I've definitely noticed, obviously, that uh, our hardware is uh, very fast these days. But it's still, there's this little bridge between you know, two minutes a frame is a really good offline rendering for some high quality render, but that's still significantly slower than 60 frames a second. <laughs> right? yeah, yeah, absolutely. absolutely. No, I mean, when I play with Vantage and I see what, what I can do in, in real time, like it's like, and then go back to V-Ray in Max, for example, and it's like, why am I waiting? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, like, um, for sure. Yeah, some things just need a little... Unfortunately, for the moment. 
Yeah. Do you see a future? I mean, I, from from what I'm hearing, obviously, there's still a lot of things that need to be uh, to be uh, solved, uh, both in our control and both out of our control in terms of how how rendering is going to be. Obviously, Chaos has uh, has tried at, or, or uses and establishes many rendering solutions. We have Corona, we have V-Ray, we have Vantage, we have Vision, we have now Enscape and all of these different things. Do you see a time where all of this is going to uh, sort of merge in some ways to a single solution that's going to be able to be flexible enough to be both offline and online at some point? So my view has always been that you can't have a render engine that does everything. Um, even though we would all like to have it, I certainly know that I would like to have it. Um, it's just not really... Um, not really feasible. It's like a specific solution that's targeted for solving a specific problem is always going to be much faster and more efficient than a general solution that does everything you ever wanted to do. Um, so maybe they will get closer and closer, yes, and there will be many situations where it doesn't matter what you use. You, you just prefer to go with whatever is fastest, which would be real time in a lot of cases. Um, but at the same time, there are situations where um, you really need a more powerful and potentially slower solution. And code is like the more you add to a piece of code, especially in the real time engine, the slower it gets, even if you don't really use it. That's one thing that kind of was really surprising for us when we started writing GPUs. So uh, for, for, for GPUs, like you add a piece of code, which may be something like that users would use every once in a blue moon. But it's there and just being there slows things down. And um, there's no way around this. Um, you have to make choices, like make specific solutions that are very well uh, targeted at a specific situation or make a general solution, but it's not going to be as fast. Yeah, yeah. interesting. But okay. Actually, if I can make one comment, because I think there is a good news behind what Vlado said for our customers. Because at the end of the day, it means whatever they are using today, whatever we are offering to them today, we will improve it, we will make it better, and we will offer even better quality in the future. So. Yeah, for sure, for sure. I think you know, obviously, Christian. What a lot of things that you've uh, you've uh, you've been able to focus on is specifically interactive uh, interactivity between things, which I think you know. As someone who's been using offline rendering for years, interactivity is a luxury that I rarely have the privilege of using sometimes. But it's really nice to be able to do that. And, and especially I'm, I'm with Vlado as well. Like when you start using things like Vantage or, or, or you know, Enscape or whatever, and you, you, you make a decision between the mouse clicks, <laughs> between when you go up and down, that's, that is, uh, that, I call that the, the infinite iteration mode, you know, where you can basically have that, those decisions making, t that makes a huge difference in the decision making process. And it actually speeds up the decision making process as well which I think is, and more, most important to me, there's no compromises. You don't go, well, I'll just split the difference. You, you can actually just get there to exactly where you want to be. Um, I think that's a fascinating thing uh, and a really great thing. Uh, okay, so I have been down the rabbit hole of uh, trying to get the most sense out of uh, Web3 and, me and the metaverse, and I've heard all kinds of crazy descriptions of what metaverse means and what it is. I have my own sort of interpretation of it or what I'd like it to be. And one of the things I've always appreciated about I don't know, Peter and Vlado, and I'm, I'm, it sounds like Christian is going to definitely be on the same boat, is the pragmatic and down-to-earth descriptions of what you actually think things are possible to do. Because I've heard some crazy things going on in terms of what people are, are, are assuming to be, which seems a lot very different. So what are what what do you feel uh, is the is uh, is going to happen in the future in the internet that that's be there be it virtual reality or not even just virtual reality just you know uh, virtual worlds or, or where we are and how does our new our company now help that that new reality in some ways? I, if I can take that first, yeah, that, that's pretty much uh, the the whole concept of the pyramid where you start with the designers you allow them to design in real time experience their design as you just said interactively in real time to make decisions change decisions on the fly while you're actually dragging the mouse 
and get exactly where you want, then you can actually present that idea high quality because of the connection to the visualization specialists, drive that decision making process into the uh, advertisement, uh, people be able to actually present in the best possible way what they've designed and actually drive that uh, into the rest of the pyramid where people need to perhaps uh, even manufacture or do something else with that information at the end, the consumers will be able to experience that. So imagine uh, just a random car manufacturer because it's kind of, I think it will be more common in the luxury goods and in the product design area in space, but imagine any of those people being able with just a few clicks to deliver their new beautiful shiny car into the hands of the consumers of the Web3 or the Metaverse or whatever we call it, who can actually experience the best possible quality in their environment and having and being able to actually drive that information directly from your CAD through the design process into the advertisement, high quality for the media that actually requires that, and at the same time drive it into the hands of the consumers right away. I think that's what we are trying to solve here, and that's that's our big ambition. Uh, and that's from the perspective of what we as scales can, uh, with the help of Enscape, with the help of everything else we've done in the past, be able to drive in, into those hands. Whether that's going to work, whether actually anyone would want to experience that, I think so. Whether people will start living in the metaverse, I doubt it, at least for a few more generations. I don't really think that's going to happen. But just like kids nowadays use their mobiles, and not just kids, even us grown-ups, if we, <laughs> if we got to be honest about it, experience a lot of that uh, on our mobiles while we wait somewhere in a line or something. Uh, the whole thing is that actually the whole uh, approach to that experience will change, and it will no longer be just a phone. It could be, uh, you know, the virtual set or something else that people could use to experience that information. But from my perspective, that's not going to be a 24-7 experience. It's going to be something that people will, uh, while they're browsing, they'll probably want to experience that. But just like the virtual reality didn't catch up fire as everybody expected, uh, it went, you know, the, the hype went up, then it went back down. And then it be became kind of a pragmatic, uh, you know, media that you could use in specific uh, scenarios and not in others. I think the whole metaverse and Web3 uh, approach would actually be applicable in specific uh, areas. And I don't think everybody would actually want to experience it 100% of the time. But that's that's my take on it. Sure. Interesting. Christian, what is your thoughts on it? Uh, I can just echo what Peter, I think there was an almost perfect answer, to be honest. <laughs> um, uh, what, what, I'm, what I think um, is really, it's a, also a matter of generations, right? Um, I think... Um, um, clearly, I am, and uh, and and uh, Peter and Vlado are much younger than I am. So, um, but uh, but I think um, there is an, especially when it comes to living in the metaverse. I think that's a different generation. I think we all are maybe too grounded <laughs> to to really um, um, spend a lot of time uh, in the virtual world. But when it comes to um, the professional um, benefits and, and using it and, and uh, um, leveraging it for professionals in design and in other spaces, absolutely, yes. Just the, the, the case Peter talked about with a car or with the furniture or, I don't know, lighting fixture when it comes to my apartment. If I, if I have uh, ideas how to renovate it, how to modernize it. Um, I think that's a, that's a no-brainer to me, and I think that's where we, in the short to midterm, definitely now with Chaos and, and Enscape, and, and with, uh, like Peter said, all the other companies and the technology we have under one roof, where we will um, play in ro a role and where we, we will come up with something, um, and the end customers uh, will benefit from that. Well, I'll, I'll, let me tell you this. This I had here's what I'm excited about um, is I you know I've been following this for a while. Vlado and Peter know very well how I've looked at VR content and worked on VR content for for a while and, and saw what's out there. So I sort of have an idea and excited about the idea that there are going to be virtual or experiences of space that are not necessarily going to be built. 
Uh, and I'm not necessarily, I agree that we're not necessarily going to live in those spaces, but we definitely will be experiencing those spaces in a lot of ways. Uh, and I think that's an exciting part of the metaverse and we'll definitely be meeting in those spaces as well. I think that those are going to be exciting. What always frustrates me about those spaces is that they're terrible designs. <laughs> they're the worst and ugliest places to be because they are not being designed by people who actually know how to design things. And I think there's an opportunity here, especially Christian, you being you know uh, an ex-architect as I am as well, that there's an opportunity for architecture to play a role in the metaverse. And if we as uh, people who give uh, those designers the tools to be able to visualize things, allow that transition for them to take that opportunity yeah. and to transfer that into the metaverse. So finally, I can be in a nicely designed virtual building instead of some ugly place with a bad coffee table. You know, it's just, it's just like, why do you need a coffee table in the metaverse? I don't know why you need a coffee table in the metaverse. <laughs> that's, still, still, that's true, but you still need to drink the real coffee, right? Yeah, yes, I need a coffee in my real space, but why does it have to be a coffee table? Why can't it be, you know, just something more interesting? No, I'm sure, you know, I'm sure if Zaha Hadid was still alive today, she would make a very interesting metaverse for us to all to experience. With no doubt, with no doubt. <laughs> Vala, what is your what is your, your take, take on, on, the, on the metaverse? So, um, I think we're already in the metaverse because if you like if I look at my life from outside like if i'm an alien and i come to earth all i'm doing all day is staring at a screen it's a different screen maybe it maybe my laptop it may be my phone it may be a tv but i'm looking at a screen at something that's not real and i mean i don't really like um if you don't know what's going on like it looks like i'm doing nothing right um so i think we're kind of already in in some kind of metaverse. Yes, it's not 3D, it's not so visual, but it's there. It's uh, it's in the phone, it's in the laptop, it's basically everywhere. And um, honestly, like my whole life is in my phone. I think my phone at this point knows more about me than anybody else. Um, so whether, whether all that needs to be 3D, I don't know, but I think the metaverse is already there. And um, We've already agreed on a set of communication methods that people from anywhere in the world working in all kinds of industries can use. There's email, there's chat, um, and all that. And everybody understands how to use those tools these days. Yeah. Um, and another thing is that if we want to compare the metaverse to the internet, at least the early days of the internet, what was so appealing about the internet is that anybody can plug into it. You could, uh, buy a machine, set up a web server, and the world will know, know about you. And you can put whatever you want there, and people will come and check it out. And until we get to that point with the metaverse, where people can build their own virtual worlds and put them out there for other people to experience, um, it's going to be uh, different. Right now, what I see is that a few very large companies are trying to build a metaverse. They want to build their metaverse. Um, but that's not exactly what it is, right? You have to give anybody the opportunity to become a, a creator in that uh, in that metaverse, uh, and that's not necessarily what these companies actually want. Um, that's very Web three of you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, but but also where we are at right now with, with the technology uh, I mentioned to you before. This is like HTML one zero. And we need to get to HTML 5.0 in order for everything to click together. And it's going to be a while before that happens. But, um, but at least uh, the effort is there. Yeah. Well, you 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 brought that up. Obviously, we know that you know right now. I don't. We don't want to bring up too many big corporate things. But I just on a on a on a on a friendly level, like your thought. There's a lot of companies out there that are being acquired for big huge amounts of dollars and they use the term metaverse they stamp that on the press release uh very easily and it just seems a little bit like okay but what i mean obviously to me when we say what we think about the metaverse it's like well we we help people that build things that are virtual so yeah of course that makes sense that's a direct thing that we can do that we can talk about 
the virtual, uh, the virtual, the meta verse, right? So what that is, but what is your thoughts about just how how the, the the technology sector is is changing right now and how people are focusing so much on this? Where where do you think that's going to go, or or where that lies in some ways? I have a pessimistic and an optimistic view on this. <laughs> Which one would you like me to share? Well, let, let's start with the pessimistic and then end with a positive note. <laughs> okay, so uh, actually, uh, it was really interesting. I had a meeting probably about a month ago with a guy. We were talking about something very different. And what struck me was that he had a very interesting view on the metaverse. And it really aligned with my darkest view of the metaverse. And I was really surprised that somebody else can think as dark as that. So, <laughs> so uh, well, yeah, basically, the concept is that the there's a lot of things in, in our communities, in the societies of the world, that are not working out very well. And a lot of these problems occur because of the physicality of the world. Natural resources, uh, specific economies in specific areas, uh, and I don't want to go into that whole uh, story, but I, I, I guess you get what I mean. And a lot mm -hmm. of these problems would not be uh, problems in a metaverse. So uh, that can be one way to look at it, that um, a lot of the problems that people want to solve outside that are unsolvable or are very difficult to solve or only the biggest governments of the world can solve because of their size. Uh, actually, a lot of that will be transferred to the metaverse and will be solved in a very different way. And uh, that's where a lot of these communities that cannot deal with the outside world will actually start living their, their own lives in the metaverse and would prefer to stay there, uh, where physically they're in a random room across the globe, but actually they're experiencing these metaverse just because that's where they can achieve things that are not achievable uh, for for everyone outside and then this kind of division between the physical and the meta would actually become stronger and the the kind of the smaller societies and the less power they have the more they will actually prefer to stay in the metaverse and uh, that would probably mean that at one point they will uh, be the first ones to really spend most of their time in the metaverse where unlike them, the richer and the bigger societies of the globe will actually have the luxury to experience the same things in the physical world because that's where they can actually, uh, you know, uh, experience physically what they want and the way they want it. So there will actually, this division may, may become even broader at one point. So this is probably the darkest view on, on, the, on the metaverse and the way it will actually uh, unfold. Uh, because the bigger governments and the societies will be in control of the technology that delivers the metaverse. Uh, they would actually prefer to have those people stay in there and they'll actually enjoy the physicality of the world themselves. So this is kind of a dark and grim view of what may happen. On a brighter side, uh, you know, the, the globalization and all of the other uh, things that are happening probably will probably in a few generations from now generate a meta government where everybody will be able to participate and that's that's what may happen as well so that's kind of a brighter view on, on the on the same thing yeah i think it's interesting that especially you know uh, like i said i've been going down the rabbit hole of the web3 integration and understanding what a decentralized internet actually implies and what it could imply to everyone is kind of an interesting process as well so i'm i'm uh, i'm i'm sitting from the outside curiously it's like hmm what is this actually going to mean for us in terms of uh, how we use the internet? Because the internet obviously has become some form of, uh, uh, of um, you know, it's an interesting form as well. Um, I think it's. I think this is great. Obviously, this there is a lot of details that you guys can't uh, discuss because they are being discussed right now in terms of how these companies are coming together. Uh, but it's very exciting to do that. So, but uh, to to think about when this is all going to happen. So when. If anything, <laughs> when do you is the possibility that we can start to see some some uh, some of the the the, the efforts that uh, Enscape and Chaos are doing starting to come together? What are, what are your thoughts on that, Christian? Um, as soon as possible. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, it's but, uh, it, come on. Um, I don't know. I don't know how I should. I could answer that question differently. Um, 
Uh, we are, as you guys know, the, 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 the deal is not closed yet. Right. Um, so you can hear me, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, yeah. okay. Um, um, so clear, yes, and you mentioned that. So we, we, we have to wait until we can really start working um, together and as one team. But you're right. We do have, of course, we have ideas. We have our brains are already working and processing. We are talking to each other a lot. Um, our people are already like uh, uh, race horses um, standing here and waiting for that they can start running. So yeah, we have a lot of uh, great ideas um, as soon as possible, to be honest. But I can't answer that question differently. I don't know, Peter or Flado, maybe you have a different answer, but I can't answer it that differently. <laughs> what I can say is that we already have started working on figuring these things out. Exactly. Uh, obviously, we got to keep in mind that there's been just a few weeks uh, since our own teams know about the deal that yep. was actually in the works for probably over six months. Uh, and uh, it's, it's something that, uh, you know, for a lot of people is still kind of in that unclear state where they're just you know, figuring out opportunities. At the same time, we have specific uh, projects that we have already started, where we want to merge the teams, where we have we want to have the have the we want to have the brightest people in the same room working on on a lot of uh, these ideas together. So that is kind kind of coming together. As as Christian Lang said, we're still waiting for the deal to close, which would happen hopefully in the next few weeks, and that will open even more doors for us. And uh, there's. The, the excitement is there in the air. We'll actually have all a lot of the meet, uh, teams meet in the next uh, few weeks and months, and that's that's going to definitely happen. And a lot, a lot of the ideas will actually be generated within those meetings because, as we already discussed, there are a lot of opportunities. And I think one of the challenges will be prioritize and figure out which are the opportunities we want to tackle first because there's, there's just going to be so many of them. Uh, and that's that's my view on this. And when I guess uh, I don't want to say something big, but uh, there's a lot of quick wins we could do right away. And I hope that in, even in the first major releases uh, this year, will, people will be able to see some of the benefits of this merger. Awesome, awesome. And Vlado, what is the thing that you're most looking forward to in terms of this uh, <laughs> this opportunity here? <laughs> Um, so actually, for me, it's uh, more about learning more about another company. Um, I've been at Chaos for like basically my entire adult life, um, <laughs> and it's um, it's always interesting to see how other people approach the same uh, problems and what solutions they come up with and how they work in general. Um, it was very similar with uh, with the Corona team. It was uh, very interesting for me to learn more about how Corona works. And obviously, even though um, both Vir and Corona try to solve the same problems, the approaches are very different and there's something to learn from, from each of them. And it's kind of similar with Enscape, but uh, it's not only about the code, it's not only about the, the product, it's the way the product is developed. Uh, it's the way the company is structured uh, and, and all that stuff. Uh, all these things, which are also very interesting to me. Yeah, yeah, that's very uh, that's very interesting and very cool. Well, I think thank you guys so much for for doing this. I, it's been uh, it's been a fascinating conversation. You guys have delivered as expected uh, uh, a lot of great information. I'm very excited to find out where we're uh, where uh, we're going to be going with this. Uh, it's really great to meet Christian. I am going to probably. Uh, ping you a couple of times with some ideas and see if you have a uh, you know your thoughts on some things because I th I think obviously um, uh, I'm excited about us us all working together and 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 figuring out where we're going to go with all of this so right. very very exciting thank you guys so much for doing this thank you Chris and uh, yeah thank you Chris it was a pleasure thanks a lot yeah thanks Chris for being the great host you always are thanks <laughs> you let us off easy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>